Hi everyone, hope you had either a good weekend or a good week, depending on when you're viewing this video. <clears throat> In this section of the course, we're going to move to talking more about the content in the Old Testament. And as you know, the Old Testament is a long book, it's a long story, so we can't even begin to scratch the surface. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the course, I thought we would explore a few of the major themes in the Old Testament. And one of the first ones I'd like to look at is the role of justice and mercy. So the Old Testament begins with the story of creation, and here's a modern depiction of the seven days of creation, or six days and a day of rest, I guess. And the story in the Old Testament quickly proceeds to what we commonly refer to as the fall, or the eating of the forbidden fruit. And it's here that we are reminded that the Bible is a very concise text, and it leaves out a lot of details. The first people eat the forbidden fruit, as we know, and the punishment that is described in Genesis 2-7 is that on the day of the, that you eat of it, you will surely die. And right away, the one of the very first stories, um, we have a mystery. The people actually don't die on that day, as God has said. So what's going on here? Of course, people over the centuries have developed all kinds of midrash to explain why the people don't die, or that the people die spiritually, or that the people will die someday, but maybe not on that day. But these are all not terribly satisfying. It's an open question, really. What, what is God's punishment, and is God being merciful here? Instead, of getting killed, God's decision is to expel them. And they end up leading lives that sound more or less ordinary and everyday to us. Um, but we see that the themes of expulsion and alienation from God continue throughout the rest of the, the Old Testament. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. We then move to the story of the first two brothers, and the Bible, Old and New Testament, is full of stories about brothers, about sibling rivalry, about favoritism, and unfortunately about how that can end in violence. So it's really in the story of Cain and Abel where we first hear the word sin. Sin is never associated with the eating of the forbidden fruit. And of course, this favoritism, uh, in this case from God, ends up in deadly violence. And like his parents, Cain is expelled. We would think under Israelite law, which comes along later, that Cain probably deserves to die for his murder. But he gets off scot-free, and moreover is protected by God. So is this justice, or mercy, or both? It perhaps seems that for God, justice is mercy, and our own sensibilities about what is just and fair can be significantly challenged by some of these stories. Of course, we get the flood story early on, and in effect, God evokes a reset for his creation, and it seems that it is his creation to do with as he wills. But he destroys the earth for a reason. In Genesis 6.11, we hear that the earth is full of violence. So the violence that's perpetrated in chapter 4 um, expands exponentially. Now, Israel's Mesopotamian neighbors have several similar flood stories where one particular character is saved and the rest of the world is destroyed. But in those stories, the gods attempt to destroy humanity because they find humans to be noisy or annoying or the gods are just in a bad mood. 
in the case of Israel, God is more interested in justice, or at least minimally trying to find a way to rid the earth of all of its violence. Of course, we all know that the flood story doesn't really work because maybe humans are the way they are, and the violence in later stories simply continues. And this first section of Genesis ends in the somewhat odd story of the Tower of Babel, where humans try to reach God with wonderful tall buildings, particularly under their own power, and God thwarts their efforts because this doesn't seem to be God's plan in reaching out to humans. So he has something different in mind. And we move to the story in Genesis 12, the call of Abram. You have to look pretty closely in this painting to find Abram, but he's there. So Abram is sort of a random Mesopotamian guy, and God tells him to move to the land of Canaan. And surprisingly, Abram complies. In chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram, so the idea of covenant becomes an important idea in the Old Testament. And we are told that Abram believes God and that Abram's belief is enough for God to consider him righteous. Later in the New Testament, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, points to this one particular moment in the Old Testament as the quintessential moment of faith. Abram believes God. Now, like Cain and Abel, there are lots of of stories about brothers, as I said, and a lot of, and many stories about alienation and expulsion. So here, Abram has two sons, at least at the beginning of the story, Isaac and Ishmael. And while no one gets killed here, we have a lot of favoritism and rivalry, and the story ends in another sad, alienating expulsion. God asks Abraham to kill the other son in chapter 22, a story that has probably generated more commentary than any other story in the entire Bible, maybe. And again, we as readers think about the justice of the entire situation. Why does God put Abraham through this test? And the answers aren't always very satisfying. In the Abraham stories, we also find that Abraham isn't always such a moral character. So again, unlike the hero stories that we find in the literature of Israel's neighbors, um, the heroes for Israel aren't always perfect. In fact, they are often very imperfect, very unjust. So in the Abram stories, we see, for example, um, Abram selling off or marrying off, you might even say in this culture, his wife to Pharaoh, ostensibly to protect himself, but Abraham, by this point, ends up getting very rich in the process. And it is here that we first encounter the character of Pharaoh, and Pharaohs are all uh, quite the same in the Bible. Um, sometimes they seem benevolent, but that usually gets the Israelites in trouble. And Egypt and Pharaoh are more or less representatives of empire in the Old Testament. And as we said, Israel being a small nation is constantly under the threat of its surrounding empires. Israel is always drawn toward riches and what seems like the protection of empires, but in the end, getting cozy with Egypt always gets them into trouble. As the generations pass, we have more stories of brothers, more favorable treatment, and more sibling rivalry, and potential for family violence. We get to the story of Jacob. And Jacob has a brother, Esau. Jacob's name means he will supplant, or even he will act treacherously, and he certainly lives up to his name. He tricks his brother out of his birthright and blessing, and is expelled from his home as a result. One thing about the Jacob story that I always find interesting is that you have to just keep reading. If you read 
each incident in isolation, you may think that the Bible is somehow approving of Jacob's somewhat treacherous actions, or his, his tricksterism. But in the end, Jacob gets tricked himself. He's tricked into marrying a woman that he wasn't particularly happy about. He is tricked by his sons later into thinking that one of his other sons have been killed, Joseph. So a lot of what happens to Jacob comes back to haunt him later in life. So there is something here again about justice, that even though justice seems to be absent from the story, it does come back and work its way into the story eventually. But unlike the other stories of expulsion, Jacob eventually returns and is re reunited with his brother in the end. In a story that we might expect to end badly, to end in violence, Jacob says in Genesis 33, when he sees his brother again after many years, for truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such favor. So in the midst of all his trickery, Jacob is able to recognize the image of God in his brother, and we are again reminded of those first humans back in Genesis, Genesis 1, in the creation story, who are created in the image of God. So it seems that in the Jacob story we find that sibling violence can be overcome, which is promising. Eventually the, the family decides to move to Egypt and apparently abandon their land that is promised to Abraham. And given the family's previous encounters with Egypt, we already know that this probably won't end well. And it doesn't, because the Israelites end up in slavery. And this is just what happens when you get cozy with the empire. Eventually, God raises up a rescuer, Moses, who becomes the quintessential prophet in the view of the biblical writers. And Israel can only be mentioned, uh, can only be rescued by God's intervention, not through their own military action. So this also represents sort of a prototypical story where it's God that intervenes to redeem his people and um, the people don't have to fight their way out of their situation. God takes care of that for them. So in the process of the Exodus, God chooses a people and forms a nation, Israel. But being chosen is a tough job. <laughs> and one thing the Old Testament shows over and over again is that being chosen doesn't automatically mean that you're good or that your behavior is going to match your calling. So if there's anything that we read in the Old Testament over and over again. Any repeating theme, it's certainly that one. Yet through the laws that God gives Moses on Mount Sinai, Israel is called to be a people of justice. And laws such as those in Leviticus, uh, those laws that seem very strange to us, ensure that Israel will be a people set apart from its neighbors. So in some way, Israel is called to live apart, live as a people of God. And the prophets in Israel that come along much later, like Isaiah, so I had you read Isaiah 53 for this week, are called by God to remind Israel of its role in the world and how Israel's actions in terms of justice must measure up with Israel's calling as a people of God. So I hope as you continue on through the rest of this course, you will think about what it means to be a called people of God, which is also the role of the church and the church's self-understanding in the world. Thanks.